Thank you. Uh, it's, thanks, Jesper, and the others, Davina, for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, yeah, Burgess asked if I was going to tell stories. I, it's too early in the morning to tell stories. that I'll have to wait for the dinner. Um, I'll keep my comments to physics. But yeah, I, it, was, it was I who met Uber at that 1988 Lake Zouche. And we went on. Uh, I was his postdoc at USC, and I, we went on to write, I just counted yesterday, 18 papers together, which I think is number two only to Jesper in, in oh, collaborating with you. Is that right? Probably. Um, so, yeah. Well, anyway, there were 18 good papers. I saved one I don't really like, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, anyway, uh, needless to say, Uber has been an enormous influence on me, well, the whole field, but me in particular, for all these um, amazing results that some of which Jean Bernard talked about. So I decided for such a momentous occasion as the 60th birthday, I was going to do something somewhat more ambitious, which is I was going to try to tell Hubert something he doesn't already know. And um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a topic that I've been working on that, like I say, as far as I know, does not have any influence on Hubert whatsoever, but I'll probably find that's wrong by the end. So anyway, the title is Free Fermions and Parafermions. Again, everybody here knows what free fermions uh, uh, are, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you if you don't. And uh, maybe the most, the key thing is the bottom bit. And that's uh, in, this, in this key bit in this slide, um, is that free fermions come up in, in unusual places. And uh, that's why they keep on, keep on keeping on, as I wrote, that they're still a central part of theoretical physics. Why well, I said the fundamental system, I mean, you could say maybe free bosons, but uh, free fermions are much more physical than free bosons. You see them all the time in condensed matter physics. So, and I would say uh, for, well, hopefully make the case in what I'm talking about, they're still possibly underused. Um, in, in physics. So I'm, now I'll tell you what a free fermion is. You'll, you can read lots of books, you'll see lots of things, but it has nothing to do with statistics, it has nothing to do with operators, nothing to do with fields. Um, what I mean by a free fermion system is that the entire spectrum has this very simple form, which is you write down a bunch of numbers. So you write down um, a bunch of numbers, epsilon 1 through L, that all the energy levels of the system are determined by taking, uh, by, by this formula. And you just choose the plus or minus signs independently, and it doesn't affect the values of these epsilons, of L, these energy levels, if you wish. And a very convenient picture for this is like that. So you have a Fermi C, and those are the levels that are filled. So that's when you choose the minus sign. Here, so the energy is the lowest if you fill all that, and then you can sum, and then if you excite something, you go. And this, to me, is what a free Fermi system is. And the key thing, to emphasize again, is that this choice doesn't affect the epsilons, the, the choice of these plus or minus signs. And so that's why we say levels are filled or empty. And that's what a free Fermi system is. Okay, everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. And now, what you'll you often see when you, you uh, write down a free Fermi system is this formula, or some equivalent form. Um, I wrote it in terms of Majorana fermions. So these are operators that anti-commute and square to one. Um, and then you've got some bilinear in these in the Hamiltonian. And then sure enough, those are free fermions. Um, and again, examples, probably everyone here knows at least one, or probably all of these, or you very knows all of them. It's not restricted to 1D. It's 2D Kataya honeycomb model that people have been talking about. It's in field theory, on the lattice, all sorts of systems, and still ones being discovered today. Um, interesting. So, a uh, canonical example um, it, uh, I'm going to do in quantum physics, although everything still works for uh, classical stuff. What time did it start, by the way? So it started about 10.50? Okay. All right, so the, uh, so th this is the canonical model, just to give you something to keep in mind. Uh, so we've got an L state quantum system, 
uh, uh, sorry, L, L two state quantum systems. And Hamiltonians the Pauli matrices, flipping spins acting on every site, and then a nearest neighbor interaction term. So it's a basic example of quantum <coughs> spin chains, the icing chain. Um, I didn't write it out because, again, most of you know it, and if you don't know it, you don't need to. But this can be mapped through a non local map on the fermion bilinears, which is exactly the form I wrote down a few slides ago. So it's a bilinear um, in these operators, so that thing turns into that. And I wrote this out as a nice matrix, which looks like that if you did this transformation. So notice this term just becomes that term. All right, so that's the canonical example I wanted to give you one. I'm going to flash this slide. This is how you would solve it, and it's not the way you'll see in most books for inexplicable reasons. I don't know why they give you much less useful ways to solve it, but anyway, this is the way you, you notice if you, with the commutation relations I wrote down, where was it? There we go. These kind of anti commutation relations I wrote down there. An important fact is anytime you take a bilinear in fermions and commute it with something that's linear in fermions, so that's some linear combination of these fermions, you get a linear back. And that's really the, in this operator formulation, the simple way. And in matrix form, you just take that matrix I wrote out in the last slide and blah, blah, blah. And in physics, when you get a matrix, you diagonalize it, right? That's all we always do. Right, we find the eigenvectors, and in this case, we get some eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and those eigenvalues are the epsilon k I wrote down in the formula because it's easy to check that if you uh, commute the Hamiltonian with these operators that are built from the eigenvectors of this matrix, you then get raising and lowering operators. And so the, the takeaway for those of you who've seen this a billion times is that these things are the zeros of a polynomial. So the eigenvectors, the zeros of the characteristic polynomial of that matrix. The, there are zeros of a polynomial, and the coefficients depend on the couplings. And in this way, you can trivially solve things with any boundary conditions you want, and all that. And what I mean by solve, instead of having to diagonalize the full Hamiltonian, you only have to diagonalize that's 2L by 2L. And that's what I mean by solve. Any boundary condition, take completely random couplings at all. Um, there is one key step you have to do, but if it's free fermions, it's easy. You have to show that these new operators you made out of the eigenvectors also end to commute. But that's it's a Hermitian matrix. That's easy to do in this case. And then you get the spectrum that I wrote down a few slides ago. And then these operators are the ones that raise the order. And you um, get the eigenvectors. So that's, that's all standard. I went through a quick. Please ask if it's uh, if I said anything confusing. All right, so tens of thousands of papers have been written doing some variation on this. You can just one way of saying you, you take your chain, favor chain, you do the John Wigner transformation. If you can find a special point where it's bilinear, you win. You solve it. You write a paper um, and try and say whatever it is you want to say. Uh, so, so there's a nice paper that came out of the quantum information people who did something that um, uh, nobody, yeah, so probably doesn't know this. Um, they, they asked the question, well, what's the most general system you can always solve by this trick I just showed? And um, they described the lattice Hamiltonian by a frustration graph. And I'll give you an example of what that is in a second. Um, and they showed for you to be able to do this to a non transformation something quite right. The graph itself has certain properties, and it matched up nicely with some things in graph theory. So I'm not going to tell you uh, uh, in detail what that is now, but it's really nice. No one had ever thought to do this. This might have been done from the physics point of view, I don't know, shortly after Jordan and Luger wrote their paper in the 20s. But uh, nobody did, and uh, of course, graph theory progressed since then. So they were able to prove when you can do that. Really nice result. But OK. I, I, Keep trying to emphasize this is an old story. Probably most of you have seen some version of it before. And the topic of this talk is, again, to say something new. And well, so the question is that all there is? And the answer is no. And uh, what it is, I'm going to tell you how that same procedure I, I outlined can be generalized to cases 
where it's not so obvious. So I said, uh, and Sarah, so I'll describe how to do this for more general models that are not bilinear as fermions. And when I say elementary algebra, uh, it means that I could teach it to a high school student, but it's not very obvious. So I'm going to, I'll tell you how that goes. And again, we'll, we're going to see lots of impressive technical talks here today. And uh, this is a pillow with the Yang Baxter equation that uh, you can purchase uh, at the Science Museum of London. I just did, when I bought it. But uh, no Yang Baxter today, despite DuBerry's brilliant lectures. Um, and one comment I wanted to address this technique I'm going to tell you about. Um, you hint at some interesting open problems. It only works for open boundary conditions. But the model remains, models you can solve by this technique remain iterable, um, but not free. Um, and I'll come back to that. All right, so now let me tell you what this incidence graph is, and now write things into a little more general form so that I can uh, use some fancier stuff. Um, anyway, so this is the Hamiltonian I wrote down a few minutes ago, the Ising model. And so instead of writing in terms of the sigma x's and the sigma z, sigma z, I'm just doing every term in the Hamiltonian I'll call h of n. And those are the sigma x's, those are that. And if we want to express this algebraically, um, and I saw, so, sorry, I should the, uh, there's coefficients here, um, and I can make those arbitrary. So you can solve this for uh, any, of the, any coefficients there. But, but what I said, I want um, the simple algebra is this, well, OK, so each of these squares, well, to one or whatever the constant is, and the neighboring ones anti-commute. So this one is less or greater. The, the index on this is one less or greater. They anti-commute, otherwise they commute. And that's all you need to know, actually, to solve the model um, uh, up to degeneracy slopes, at least to compute all the epsilon. And so what I meant by this incidence graph that the quantum information people uh, said is just when you, the point is you put a node for each term in the Hamiltonian, the graph, the vertex of this graph, uh, for each term in the Hamiltonian, if they anti-commute, um, you draw a line between them, put an edge between them, if they commute, you know. And with the fermion Hamiltonian, I can always split the Hamiltonian into these individual terms such that they either commute or anti-commute. That's at least the class of, and that, and so what they proved is certain properties of this graph. Okay, okay, then you can solve. And so like I said a few seconds ago, you just just by knowing this, you can run that procedure I did before to compute all the epsilons just by knowing those t's and and this graph. Okay, so now here's the the new. Thing two years ago, mm -hmm. me. Um, so let's take a model that's not bilinear fermion. So it's not a complicated model. It's uh, again just a chain of two-state systems. But instead, it's got next nearest neighbor interactions where you flip a spin multiplied by the two neighboring sigma z. So x z z. And sum over all that. Again, I can put arbitrary coefficients. So that's the model. So if I write down this algebra that I just wrote down for icing, it's a little more complicated. Well, so the nearest neighbors anti-commute, but also next nearest neighbors anti-commute, which is pretty obvious from that. Um, and then farther apart commute. And so if I draw this incidence graph, it looks like the zigzag ladder trellis. So H1 doesn't commute H1. And very, like I mentioned quickly, uh, I'm going to do open boundary conditions. So that's, that's the algebra. Um, and so I can do a giordano vigner transformation. Um, and you'll see, in fact, that it's not solvable. And if you look at this nice paper, you'll see that this graph violates one of the conditions that the graph needs to satisfy. So you can't solve this. It proved you cannot solve this via giordano vigner There's no trick that somehow turns this Hamiltonian with four fermions in it into one with two, um, at least locally. Um, for people who like supersymmetry, a lot of people like supersymmetry. Turns out there is a supersymmetry in this model, which, as far as I tell, is actually not that relevant to what we said, but it is there. Let me introduce another model. So, I, in the title, it was free fermions and parafermions. So, let me broaden out a little. I'm going to 
since I don't have a ton of time, I'm not going to have be able to say a lot about the parafermion case. But um, but uh, here's another generalization. This is kind of the obvious generalization of the icing model to an end state system. So instead of having spin flip, you shift the spin. So we've got an end state system these matrices are acting on. So instead of sigma x, I have what I call tau, which shifts the spin. And instead of having just measure whether the spin is uh, up or down, I have an end state thing. So I measure it's right there. And omega in this talk is always an f 3 This primitive f 3 all right, so, uh, so again, we can make a Hamiltonian here, just like I see some of all these things. And the odd terms there are, are just flip, and then the even terms are measure the spin. Um, now, you'll know one thing. It's not so nice if I have n greater than 2. This isn't permission. And I haven't forgotten it. There's no plus hc there. The model I'm going to describe is not permission. But it's simple. It's cool. And um, it obeys this nice simple algebra. So again, you take these to the nth power, and you get a number, these operators. But when you, they don't anti-commute, they pick up the phase, characteristic of parafermion systems. That's, well, I'm not going to define parafermions, but again, so we can go And then they commute the front part. So it's, in a sense, it's the most natural generalization of the icing chain uh, uh, to an end state system. I emphasize it's not permission. The parafermion models that most people have studied, including me, are the, the permission version of this. This one is a model Baxter came up with 30 years ago. Yeah. There's another thing I just want, I'm literally flashing this for a few experts. There's a more complicated general one, which is sometimes called this horrible name, the Tau 2 model. Um, but this is when you take these H's, it's still not permission, and then you allow them to. You put in a row, and again, if you like parafermions like I do, that's a parafermion by the So I just wanted to mention that in case people like it. All right, so now I said I have a result. I can show that these models are free, but not via the jadon wigner transformation. And so let me, I'm just going to outline it. It's, um, I mean, it's technical in the sense that there's a lot of formulas. Um, so I, I, Uber, I know, has read the Onsager's original paper on the icing model. I have, I have, maybe a few of the other ones. It, ha it has a reputation for being difficult um, because he wrote out all the details. It's like a calculation. He wrote out the details. And so I don't know, people shrinking violets, they see the paper and don't want to read matrices and things like that. Um, but it's actually really simple what Ansager did. And this is what I'm describing is simple in the same sense that it is literally just algebra. This one's more tedious than what Ansager did. But there's nothing subtle. I don't invoke some cohomological argument at some point. So there's a procedure I'm going to outline now, and it, it works. I don't well, no, you can ask why it works is a more mystical question, but it works. And so, OK, so I'm outlining the procedure. So you take this model, you find a transfer matrix that this Hamiltonian computes with it. Easier said than done, but in this case, you do it. And I'll give you some examples in a minute, so just trust me. And this transfer matrix has a parameter u. People do integrability are familiar with doing it, such things, but I'm kind of reverse engineering the transfer matrix by starting with Hamiltonian. But it's not hard to find it in these cases. And then you show that these things commute. Now, you could use Yang Baxter, but I, I banned Yang Baxter from this talk. So in this case, you do some more algebra, and you can show that these transfer matrices commute. It's not, that one's a little tedious, but it's not okay. just algebra. You find the quote inverse. I put inverse in quotes because there's another one. In the simplest cases, you would just take the matrix at minus this value, which is again common in integrability. And you multiply them, and, and why I say it's so quote inverse is because you get some polynomial there. All right, so here's now the, this part is comes up all the time. Here's the, if you wish, the miraculous part of this is I can now construct those raising and lowering operators like I did easily for uh, the Jadon Wigner type systems. Anytime you have a zero of this polynomial, I can construct a raising and lowering operator. And uh, you need one more thing. Uh, 
this thing is essentially, it's an extra Hamiltonian generator, it's the edge. So in the icing example, I'll, I'll show this again, but it would be just putting sigma z at the edge of the system. Remember I emphasized, I have to have an edge in, for this to work. And um, so that's it. So I emphasize none of this is obvious, but, um, but it's all true. And in particular, you can then show that these things went through the Hamiltonian. I put the omega there if we're back just to, to uh, icing, or to this, this four fermion model I wrote, this would just be minus one, so this is a thing. And uh, these epsilons, it, my conventions here, are uh, just the inverse of the roots of that polynomial. And that's all. So I mean, it's, it's miraculous. I don't want to emphasize this is not obvious, and it's not. Uh, uh, it's, it's, I think it's great. So that's, that's these results. So let me, so that, that was an outline of how it works. I'm, I'm now going to basically give you examples that hopefully illustrate what I said a little more and then talk a little bit about statistics. Yeah, where am I in time? Let's see. I've got about 15 minutes left or so. Okay. Good. All right. So uh, let me uh, talk about the transfer matrix. So let's do icing. So in the icing case, remember this was the Hamiltonian. The terms were all sigma x's and sigma z, sigma z's. They just anti-commuted um, for successive terms in this picture. Well, so the transfer matrix, easy to check. I, I maybe this was somewhere in the literature before, but it's easy to check that um, you can construct a conserved current, um, or cons this whole transfer matrix, by just taking, all right, so the first one is just a hack. Uh, Hamiltonian itself. Then the second one, you just take the products of these terms such that they're not next to each other. And it's not immediately obvious, but it's like a two minute calculation to show that that and that one commute. <laughs> and then you take the next one, which is again just products of these things, but where they're never allowed, to be. some were all of them, but where they're not, they're not allowed to be next to each other. So maybe that's a little bit. But um, anyway, it's not hard to show. It takes a little work to show it. We have to show this one. Nothing to do with that one, but it's not. Again, it's just algebra. And so then you take this combination, and this is where I said this is the transfer matrix there. And its key thing is it's finite there because, well, we have a finite system, and also we have this rule that it can only be so far apart. And again, a little bit of work. This one takes a little trickery to show. Let's get a trick, it's not hard. Show that what happens when you multiply those two. And by the way, this is, since this is a finite series, that's a finite problem. Um, you can get the local conserved charges, or get some local conserved charges by taking the logarithm through. Now, this isn't the most generalizing transfer matrix that you would write down normally. This is a special case of that. Anyway. But it serves our purpose. So now, much less obviously, but again, not that hard to show, is you take my model, so this was a model where sigma x, sigma z, sigma z on successive sites, so when you write the Hamiltonian, um, I guess, as the sum of terms like this, but in the other example, then they anti-commute also when there are two indices apart in the sum here, which that is two sites apart. And so then you construct this thing, again, following the same rule Except, well, same on spirit of the rule. So the rule for icing was I like, just write down product of any two of these terms um, such that they couldn't be next to each other. Well, now our exclusion rule is two sites apart, so you write the same thing, two sites apart. You can do this for n sites apart, obviously, once you get the idea. And so um, you write down those things. And again, it's not obvious that these all commute with each other. And so we, we make a transfer matrix out of that sum, and then you compute. So it's kind of neat, um, and it's very simple, but I don't think anyone noticed it before. And what's even more shocking for me is the same thing works for these power fermions, too, when you have the space. So again, the same rule. This one that's back to nearest neighbor. Um, so you write this just like icing. So this literally just cut and pasted from the icing slide and you construct this. Again, the inversion relation here is not so obvious, but you mess around and you discover that one. So, those are as, and this other funny model, I flashed a slide and also see what happens. So, yes, uh, yeah, I have time to do this. Yeah, I have time to do this.
this. Um, there is, okay, I just, I, here's the identity that lets you show that these things, um, you can construct the raising and lowering operator. So it's not a priority, but I can show in all these examples um, for that I gave um, that you, uh, you, you just take this transfer matrix and you kind of commute it through this extra edge mode. So, um, and you know, say, so now I mentioned this, this is how I construct the raising and lowering operators. So this is the nth, so if I have n of these operators, then I take one more and it doesn't commute with the one on the edge, but then commutes with everything else. So that's what chi is. And I mentioned like a nice thing, it would be just take sigma z at the end of the system. And so that's why that would be the minus sign for x. But this is the full parafermion case, just set minus. If you don't like parafermions, just set omega equals minus one. And you can then just check that when you commute, T through this combination, well, it almost commutes through this combination. Notice the only difference between the two things in parentheses. There's an omega there, there's not. But you, well, you do the calculation. And uh, I uh, wish I had a more profound way of saying it, but it happens. And then you can check, again, more algebra, that uh, this thing uh, is a raising law. And so then you know the spectrum has to be a bit fuller. I showed it before. Um, so in this algebra, so in this case, let me now focus on the example I gave, with this, which is four fermions in the uh, fermionic language, uh, or sigma x, sigma z, sigma z in the Masonic language and the spin language. And so then you can check this more work, um, but then you check that these things satisfy the fermion anti-commutation relation. So we've made free fermions, but they're this incredibly complicated, so let me show this again, there's this incredibly complicated linear combination of, or non-linear combination, non-linear, non-local combination of the spin. So it's not at all obvious. In, um, so how do they write in terms of fermions? I, I don't know. I mean, I, you can write, so the way I did it originally, in fact, in this free parafermion paper I wrote out a while ago, you can write out a series for this. So since it's starting at the edge, you can write a series sort of falling off from the edge. But it's this horrible, there is a closed form formula in, in the parafermion case in my paper, but it's, it's horrendous and um, difficult to prove things. So, so I should have said, I wrote a paper, well, in fact, I'll say it. But yeah, it's, it, it, it's nothing nice. It is nothing nice. And only later, I mean, and I had all sorts of, the paper, my, my free part, my free fermion paper, there's four separate versions of that. And so I figured out how to make it simpler and simpler. The first version did what I just said, write it out explicitly and horribly. Um, I don't, um, yeah, no, it's, it's I, Honestly, I had no intuition as to why, that, but, but eventually you realize, oh, you can write it like that, which in retrospect you say the usual more, oh, well, that's almost obvious. Why didn't I write that that a year earlier? But can you can about that. Yeah. About the same thing. Uh, so you're working with an open system, so closer yeah. to the edges, it's going to be complicated. But if you make it very large and look in the middle, yeah. does this thing become simple? Not that I know. Because it's some horrendous series, and if you uh, tip, well, it depends on what, what your coupling region is. You know, it'll fall off exponentially. So say I'm in the order phase. Uh, it'll fall off exponentially. Um, but no, not that I know. I, I, and I tried, and I, I, I did all this by, I could say by brute force. I did it by brute force, and then finally found this slicker way to do it. Yeah. Good. Any more questions?
like this. So you have for an end state system. So you have for an end state system, you have uh, uh, you have n sets of energy levels, which each fill just one to a thing. So all the algebra I described works. There's no graph theory yet. It'll presumably be some directed graph. And so that's an interesting uh, open problem. OK, Jesper, do I have a few minutes left? Because um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the physics of this. OK, OK. So I'll quickly tell you just a little bit about the physics of this chain. So um, this is the, the, the four Fermi chain. Again, so wrote out again, so x, z, z. Now, one thing I didn't mention before uh, is that, um, so this is slightly different. Notice I've got z, z, x and x, z, z here. Um, again, a fact uh, nobody had ever noted before, those two things commute with each other. So I can just solve this one using this techniques and that one using the techniques. The two Hamiltonians, each term by term commutes with each other. So looking at that, you get this free fermion form, um, as I've said multiple times, and then this exponential degeneracy. Um, so the physics of this, so it's not CFT. So I said I was going to avoid stuff Hubert uh, knows a lot about. This is uh, a theory. So now if you take, so this phase diagram says you stagger the coupling. So I made a point to say you can stagger as much as you want. Um, this is the point I've been talking about so far, the uniform point. This, sorry, this is the point where it'd be uniform, and this has dynamical critical exponent three halves. It has something to cape with KPZ. I don't know, but maybe it does. And then you kind of, you flow down to icing if you, if you stagger the couplings, as maybe not so surprising. But the thing that I find really stunning, I've, I've sort of said, I said this at the beginning, but I'll say it again. So if you impose periodic boundary conditions, same model, so remember we have these funny degeneracies, exponentially large. Now you put periodic boundary condition that breaks the degeneracies. Um, and so what happened, it's, it's a case that, that has been discussed in the literature. It's a kind of physics that's been discussed in the literature, but not much. And since this is an integrable model, this would be interesting. So what happens, I said so for the, the pure XZZ system, the dynamical critical exponent is 3 halves, the thing in the middle. But then now I just make it periodic boundary conditions. I've got all these degeneracies, they split. Okay, so it's a gapless system to begin with, but now I've got, it's presumably still gapless, but with a, a, a weaker Z. There's some bad numerics that we did, and it's maybe Z cubed. And even actually people who are much better than us uh, did numerics, and again, it's consistent with Z equal, uh, K, sorry, K cubed, uh, Z equals three dispersion. But this model is integrable. Um, but I, you know, maybe Uber's stronger than I am. I, I, it's, it's not, there's no U1 symmetry, so you can't use all the usual Beton sot stuff. So I failed, I wasted a month of my life trying to use integrability on this model, but there's people in this room who know more about integrability than me, and I know a lot, so, uh, but, but you guys know more, a bunch of you. And uh, so maybe you can figure out how you can get to z equals 3. So yes, so please, um, someone should try and understand that. Because they say these model, there's other models you can ask me about where you have this thing. All right, then the last thing, this one I really will flash, yes, but, um, is now if you want to do some physics, um, you can combine this four fermion model that I just wrote down with um, icing. This one's not even integrable, but you get something really nice. Um, you get, can get the tricritical icing point at a nice value there. And this is the phase diagram. So this is icing. The point that I, I should have drawn it in, the pure four Fermi points up here. And what happens in between these two points, it's gapped. So the moment you add icing in, it gaps out that other system. And you get order disorder coexistence. There's an exact ground state, and they get tricritical icing model. And why I wanted to emphasize this is because there's uh, lots of uh, people in quantum information develop new methods 
to do stuff. And then they test them on icing, which is the worst possible model to test them on. It's the first thing you should test them on, but it's the worst because everything works for icing. It's free fermion, it's integrable, it's beautiful, it's this, it's that. Now, it's, it's very non-trivial, but kind of all numerical techniques work on it. But this model, say you add this four Fermi term I've been harping on, um, so you add it a little here, but then you add a coefficient order one or 0.856 to this coefficient, and you get a very non-trivial critical point. It's not integrable, but it's non-trivial. So if you have your numerics, um, okay, fine, you test them first there, but then you just add this coupling. You're not increasing the size of the Hilbert space. You're not changing the symmetries, except for the integrable ones. And, um, and you can do that. So I wanted to mention that as a moral for people uh, as an advertisement. Okay, so, sorry, I think I've, now I've run over enough, so I'll stop. Uh, I will, uh, uh, well, I'll go back to that slide. There's some, eh, not, none of the conclusions are particularly important, except for that one, so anyway. Thanks for having me. Okay, thanks for that, Paul. Uh, we do. Uh, okay, so. So, do you know a model where the spectrum would have the structure you described, the plus or minus epsilon i's, but the degeneracies would not be trivial and depend on i? Y it's yeah. in your model, the degeneracies are always the same. Or am I wrong? In, in at least the ones we did, uh, it's not 100% obvious that they always have to be, but certainly all the examples I, I know of are, they are. Um, yeah, uh, there's a funny model, Carl Jan and I, studied that we called a Cooper pair model that has a free fermion spectrum, again, only with open boundary conditions, but the degeneracies do depend on level. So this one would enter the classification you were mentioning in terms of graphs? Because um, I think we have a model like this. No, I, I think mean, it, I it, it, about it. That's interesting. Well, well, you'll have to tell me about it. Yeah, I think it, I told them about it. I, th I can't remember. I think that doesn't enter their classification. So it can't be, so, so their, their result is it can be solved by this technique. Mm -hmm. And so then that model can't be solved by okay. that technique. So yeah, so there's one, so, so if you have one too, this would, yeah, because I've been thinking a lot about this, so good. Okay. All right, so sorry.